All right. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, your children are gathered here today in humble gratitude for all the grace and mercy that you have shown us. Guide us in your wisdom. Guide us in the path you want us to walk. Guide us with open hearts and open minds to your word. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus Christ. It's taken from Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. For the Lord is the great God. The great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. And the mountains belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are his people of his pastor, the flock under his care. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is 555. We are marching on Zion. We're going to start each hymn with the chorus and then the verses. Just follow me. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion. Beyond that beautiful city of God. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song of sweet accord. Join in a song of sweet accord. And thus, around the throne, and thus, around the throne, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching over to Zion, young and beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, the children of the heavenly king, the children of the heavenly king, may speak their Before we reach the heavenly gates, before we reach the heavenly gates, we walk those empty feet and walk those golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. To fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. Oh, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Amen. 24, 542. Verses 1, 3, and 4.
asking for your strength. We ask you for healing for Greg, for Megan, for handicapped housing. Show her the way. Give her a place to stay. 
for Dottie and S with the Bentons and the Haddons. Bring them peace and comfort. Give Dottie strength. For the Susie family, for the McAndrews, for healing both families. Lord, wrap them in your strength and your power. For Bob, Christine, Ben, and Jeremiah. Pam, Ray, Sean, Terry, Donna, Carol, we ask them, we ask that you heal them, that you give them strength. Let them know that they're not alone. Let them know that you are with them in their trials. We ask you for help Dale with her financial problems. Cole for strength and Tommy. For Carissa, for Martha and Jim, give Martha strength to give Jim comfort. Give Jim healing, dear Lord. Let him know that you have him in the palm of your hands. For Dottie, for Stephen, give her comfort knowing that she lost her young granddaughter. For John and Diane, give them guidance. Happy birthday for my beloved granddaughter Grace, for David, for healing for Jenna. We ask all these in your name, dear Lord. We ask you to gather them and bring them. And let us not forget Jordan and family. Bring them strength, bring them comfort, knowing that you are with them always. For healing for John, George, Bill, and Ray, and Xavier. And for Abby and Elizabeth, give them guidance. Show them the way, Lord. Show them the footsteps you want them to take. We ask all of these in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, and verses 12 to 23 in the New Living Translation. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our teaching, all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true 
if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. 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 You guys all know that Mr. Chris Allen is not here today, so the sermonic song is something that we will sing together. It's one that we all know well, and it is How Great Thou Art. we still acknowledge that you are great. You are awesome and wonderful. The peace that only comes from you, Father, that is the peace that we seek today. Because we know in you we have all things that we need. We remember the stories of you weeping for the loss of your friend Lazarus. 
remember that you were moved with compassion for the people. And even now we know that you are moved with compassion for us. For Sister Dottie rushed again, Father, in the loss of her granddaughter. For Brother Gordon and the Threadfall family and the loss of Sister Mary Ellen. And all of those who are facing challenges in our midst, we pray your grace. We pray your strength and your peace would be manifest. Lord, even now, as I begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I pray that your spirit of comfort and your spirit of truth would reveal himself through us and with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, dear friends. Welcome to Canterbury Chapel. My name is Pastor Warren Manigault. It is indeed my honor to greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to our visitors and to those joining us via social media. We are located here at 381 South Main Street in Attleboro where faith in Jesus Christ is our foundation. Thank you for joining us this morning. The title of our message this morning is Stand Firm. Stand Firm. This past week has been very challenging here at Candlebury Chapel. Truth be told, the last several months have been difficult for a number of reasons. We've had dear members of our fellowship face many health issues from long COVID to RMV, strokes, heart attacks, broken hips, and several other difficult challenges with no respite in sight. This past, this past couple of months, we've lost Sister Tookie and this past week, we lost Sister Mary Ellen, and Sister Dottie lost her 29-year-old granddaughter, Caroline. When we are faced with these types of life-altering challenges, one may begin to wonder what's really going on. It can have a deleterious effect on your hope and your courage. And if we're not careful, other voices around us may creep in, or, they, or perhaps the enemy of your soul may creep in with a seed of doubt and say things like, I thought you were a Christian. Why would God allow these things to happen to you? What good is your faith? What good is your religion? Why do you even bother to go to that chapel in the first place? Seems to me that your life's no better than mine. Why would you even bother? But you see, beloved, they don't know, and we sometimes as well forget the most important detail about life here in the flesh. And our brother Job testifies in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, that humanity is frail. How short is life? How full of trouble? We blossom like a flower and then wither like a flower. Like a passing shadow, we quickly disappear. This happens to all of mankind and to all created things, not just to Christians. But the difference between the world and those of us who are Christians, those of us who are Christ-like followers and believers in Jesus Christ, is exactly that. We have Christ, the source of life eternal. Yes, our physical earthly lives may end in a whisper or a vapor, but our eternal lives continue because of Christ. What we have that makes us different from the world is that we are of Christ. Remember what Jesus himself said in John 16, 33. He said, I told you all that this in advance so that you will have peace. In other words, before he was leaving his disciples, he said, I'm warning you ahead of time that you're going to face some challenges in life, and I'm telling you now so that when the challenges come, it does not discourage you. Here on earth, you will have many trials. You will have trouble. You will have sorrows. But take heart. Be of good cheer. Be encouraged, believe it, beloved, because I have overcome the world. Don't let the trials and struggles of life discourage you because you are of Christ. 
Yes, this life is a vapor. Yes, you will have pain and aches and, and trouble and tribulation, but God is greater than your trouble. Did you hear that, beloved? While you live on this earth and you dwell in this body, you will have troubles, trials, struggles, challenges, disappointments, discouragement. Some so devastating, in fact, they will rock you to your core and shake your very faith. But be of good courage. Remember to hold on to your faith and the promises of God. Stand firm in Christ, the hope of our glory, the rock of our salvation, our Redeemer and soon coming King, who will reward all of us who do not give up or and or give in to our doubts or to our humanity. But instead, we should stand firm. This is what Brother Paul the Apostle was saying <laughs> to the Corinthian church and to the church today. In our text in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2, he describes how the gospel is the benefit for man. Did you know that the gospel is a benefit to you? Did you know that the gospel is a good thing for you? But beloved, the gospel is only a benefit if it is first received and then stood upon. Only if we believe it and stand on it. We've discussed many times the word gospel and that it means good news, have we not? Yes. As the word is used in ancient times, it didn't have to describe the salvation in Jesus Christ at all. It simply meant good news. But we as followers of Jesus Christ we know that we have the best good news ever. And that that's that we can be saved from our sins in this life and the punishment we deserve from God because of what Jesus did for us on Calvary and because Jesus was resurrected and now sits at the right hand of God. That, beloved, is the good news. The gospel that we are standing firm on today and will stand on for all eternity. God said what? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will go on forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't allow the challenges of life and the inherent doubt that can come with those life challenges discourage you or cause you to question your faith. The number one tool in the arsenal of the enemy of your soul, that's Satan, by the way, is doubt. His number one screwdriver, his number one hammer, hacksaw, his number, his number one tool that he tries to leverage against humanity is doubt. It was the tool he used against humanity in the garden, and it's still the number one tool he uses the snake that he is, and tries to sow seeds of doubt in your spirit. But look at how Paul handles these seeds of doubt concerning the resurrection of the dead. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. But tell me this, he says to the Corinthian church, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there is no resurrection from the dead? You see that, beloved? Why are some of you doubting the gospel that we preach on which your whole salvation is standing, he's asking. He goes on by following their flawed reasoning of doubt and says in verse 13, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. He goes on. And we apostles would, would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection from the dead. You see this, beloved? This seed of doubt that had crept into the Corinthian church about the resurrection is no small thing. That's right, beloved. Doubt is no small thing. For it changed the course of all human history with four little words. Did God really say? The seed of doubt was sown with four little words in the Garden of Eden. 
Did God actually say? Did God really say you would not eat from any tree of the garden? That was a seed of doubt. Brother Paul continues to expose their flaw and their seeds of doubt. Look at verse 16. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are, here's the rub, still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, in this flesh, Pastor Warren's version, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In other words, we're a bunch of fools. Because we believe the hopes of men a lot. Is that the case? So you see, beloved, allowing the seeds of doubt to creep in, not only are we lost in our sins, but all who have died believing as we believe today are lost for all eternity. God forbid. Now as believers in Christ, who are standing firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know that this cannot and is not true. And it's completely antithetical to our faith and the hope of our salvation. So as believers, we have to reject this type of thinking. Some people call it stinking thinking. I don't know. I kind of like that myself. We have to reject the spirit of doubt and unbelief that may creep in during times of great struggle, during times of challenge, during times of discouragement, during times of disappointment, during times of human failure, during times of human uh, 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 vulgarity during, during times that the things that we see on the news that the, the murders of those in Iowa, the things that, that we think are reprehensible that represent humanity, we have to hold fast to the truth. We have to remind ourselves to stand firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Especially when we lose loved ones. Once we've prayed for, for healing for months. Once that we beseech God earnestly for hours on our knees, saying, Lord, touch, Lord, heal, Lord, restore, Lord, raise up, and then poof, they're taken from us. We must look out and watch out for the seeds of doubt. We must recognize that Sometimes God decides to call people into his eternal midst because God is sovereign and he calls the shots, not us. Now, we don't like that, do we? Especially Americans. We, don't, we think we call the shots, especially New Englanders. We know we call the shots, right? The revolution started in Boston, didn't it? But we must remember that even though they are not with us physically, they are with God in glory. And the same spirit of God that is in heaven is the same spirit of God that is in you. So even now, we are still with them. Amen? Amen. Amen. And all the saints who have done and gone before us, who stood firm in the gospel. And we too will join them. Even when we pass from life through death. Notice I said, not into, through death. Because death is simply the gate the portal through which we enter into eternal life as Christians. You do realize that, right? Yep. Death is simply the door. It's the passageway that brings us to our eternal inheritance. Now, we don't like to go through that door, do we? But it's a door that we will all go through as humans, nevertheless. Even Christ himself went through the door of death. Did he not? So we will all pass from life through death. Or when we are raptured alive by Jesus Christ at his second advent, his second coming. For as followers of Jesus Christ, who are standing firm, we know and believe, like Brother Paul says in verse 20, in fact, beloved, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. Yes, Christ is the first resurrected, glorified body, and we will also be resurrected with glorified bodies as well. But that body, by the way, looks very much like the body you have today. Some of us are like, boy, I'm disappointed. I want a better one. I want a one with a little less fat on it, don't you think? But we will be resurrected with glorified bodies that look very much like we look today. But, 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 but beloved, 
These bodies will be eternal. Never again to see corruption. Never again to see sickness. Never again to see death. Bodies that will enable us to be in the pure, holy, sinless presence of God himself. 1 John 3, 2 says it like this. Dear friends, we, all, we, we are already God's children, but he has not shown us what, will be, what, what, we, what we will be like when Christ appears. But what we do know is that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Remember the story of the transfiguration when Jesus went up and was transfigured and the prophets appeared to him and the disciples uh, Peter and John were there beholding the transfiguration and Jesus looked like blinding light? Think about it that way. We will see God as he really is. But in order to exist, in order to be in that presence of God, we need different bodies than we got today. Amen? Amen. This is what we're standing firm in as believers in Christ. Don't let doubt move you from your faith in God. Don't let the death of loved ones cause you to doubt that God is the God of your salvation. But the Paul makes this so plain in 1 Corinthians 15, tw uh, 21 to 23. He said, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. That man's Christ Jesus, by the way. Just as everyone dies because all belong to Adam, that means we're human beings, right? Everyone who belongs to Christ, Christians, will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, meaning as our example, as the first among us, right? Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Amen? Amen. Beloved, this is the gospel that we have believed, and this is the gospel on which we stand. So I implore you today, in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, stand firm. Do not allow the discouragement of life or the sorrows of death lead you astray. Don't allow those who do not know or know your God or have faith sow seeds of doubt in you. Don't allow those who are far away from God to explain God to you. Don't allow those who do not know our God or belong to Christ lead you away from him. Stand firm in the gospel of your salvation. For I tell you truly, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, will he find you in faith in the earth. Amen. Amen. Amen.
that I hold in my hands, but not only with these gifts that I hold in my hands, but with our very hearts and our very lives. What I hold in my hand represents a portion of the labor of our lives throughout the weeks and months that have passed. But before we had seed to sow, Father, you gave it to us. And so we simply return it to you in obedience. We sow it into this ministry so that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be preached from this place and beyond. And we pray, God, that we would be sowing into good ground as we stand firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Breathe on this. Let it be magnified for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 For this reason, my beloved, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. 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 Please join me for our closing hymn, Majesty. Love us from his throne. 